great. Wonderful, Nish. Thank you so much for your willingness to continue deepening in dialogue, the process of dialogue. And um, I prepared some questions and I would love to go through these questions and maybe you find some appropriate answers to them. And um, maybe before we start, what do you think? Shall we attune a moment to mm -hmm. our presence to each other? Yes, we can do that. For a minute or so. Thank you. So I'm very much interested in, um, in creativity, creativity and the movement that allows this process to become creative, creative within a dialogue. Hmm. So my first question is how and through what does dialogue considered as a method enable creation, the creation of an order, a new order. And to what extent is creativity or the creative movement and unfolding of something implicit, relevant. It might be useful to um, just remind ourselves when we were speaking last time um, about just referring briefly to the diamond model and how we have the whole which becomes the part and then the part returns back into the whole. And last time we referred to that process as a circle, the whole becoming the part, the part returning to the whole and that circle is happening in each moment. So there is a constant iteration of that circle 
when we are in dialogue with one another. And what I see happening is that as this circle is, as we see this iteration of this circle, the whole and the part are evolving together. So the whole becomes the part, then the, the part undergoes some kind of change through, through dialogue. And then that change, that slightly changed part feeds back into the whole. And then the whole is also slightly changed. And so we have a process whereby the whole and the part are moving forward together. And there's an increase in the complexification or the complexity of both of these as they move forward together. Um, and I think we can think of that if we think of this iteration of the circle and an increase in the complexity between the whole and the part or, or of the whole and the part, we can think of there being a, an upward evolutionary pressure as, as the, the circle is iterating. There's, there's something that's gently pressing the whole and the part towards what we can call some kind of evolution or some kind of development. And I think at some point when there is significant insight, we see some kind of leap in the circle, a, a, a discontinuous leap in the circle. And that's what creates a completely new order that is, different to what was there, radically different to what was there before. Um, it's a new order of being and consciousness that emerges through this evolutionary insight that can emerge in dialogue. Mm -hmm. Are there, thank you, are there any, so prerequisites um, mm. allow this process as we are when we start mm. from the very beginning there are two persons who start moving into a, a dialogue mm. so there are are there prerequisites uh, from the state of consciousness, for example, just for an example, and as a question, um, that allows maybe a similar state of consciousness or um, a sort of attention. Uh, last time we spoke about the archetypes, male and female. So it's it's a question. Are there prerequisites? Was its criteria that um, are necessary to open up this flow, this movement in the way that it becomes creative to build up and to build up and to evolve a new order. Since each iteration of this whole part circle is a new creative movement of unfolding and then enfolding. So the, the whole unfolds into the part, the part is then enfolded back into the whole. And I think the reason that this 
can result in evolution is because the whole and the part both have their own intelligence. And there's a dance of creativity between this intelligence of the whole and the intelligence of the part. But in order for each person in this dialogue to be able to engage in that dance, I think that, yes, there are one or two necessary pre prerequisites for that to be possible, given, given the very nature of this unfolding and unfolding process. I would say the first of those is that each person in the dialogue must be able to have access to the whole through being able to move in consciousness to silence. Um, for the whole to speak to the part, the part has to be silent for a period, however short or long that is, so that the whole can, if you like, access that silent part or that silent subject and object that's engaging in the dialogue. So if somebody is not yet able to access that silence, or hasn't yet developed that capacity for entering into that silence, then it's going to be more difficult for the whole to be able to speak through that person or through that part. So I would say for, for this real dialogue to take place of the type that we're exploring, each person in the dialogue who is participating in the dialogue must have that basic capacity or competency, however we want to phrase it, to be able to, to some degree at least, be able to access silence through which the whole can then speak. Um, I would say that's the, the, the most important prerequisite because the circle just can't instantiate if anybody is only engaged in their own thinking process. If, if that can't be temporarily suspended, then the circle, as we discussed last time, the circle will be broken. That full unfolding won't take place because we, we, we won't be prepared vehicles for what the whole wants to manifest into us or through us. Um, and I would say the second prerequisite or criteria is that none of the participants in the dialogue should have an agenda or should have any view that they want to promote or any view that they want to defend. Because then you don't have a dialogue, you have a debate. Um, and, and the debate is something different. There's no, this circle that we're describing is not a debate. A debate is merely a, um, a, um, a meeting of fragments. It's what I would call a fragmentation rather than a multiplicity. Then we've become fragments rather than parts. So I would say the criteria has to be that none of the participants have um, any kind of well-defined agenda when they come to the dialogue or participating in the dialogue. And none of them must come into the process already holding a view that they wish to defend or promote. So there must be absolute openness and to any possibility that can arise. No possibility uh, of what could manifest must be um, eliminated before we even start, which is what would happen if somebody has an agenda or a view. Um, 
So I would say those are the, the, the two main prerequisites, the access to the silence and n nobody coming in with, a, with an agenda or a view. In addition, I do have a question mm -hmm. on that. So is it possible that we enter a in a dialogue, holding a question and not knowing how this question will unfold, mm -hmm. what kind of potential, what kind of order or creation will unfold. So we, we live in very challenging times and um, we are looking up for solutions. But if we allow ourselves to deepen into a dialogue connecting to this deeper inner wisdom, might it be possible that we find a new answer, order, creation, Yes, I think that when we are in a dialogue, and if that dialogue is going to genuinely be a, a what we're calling a true dialogue, then, and if the dialogue as we're doing today is being mediated by questions, a series of questions, for that dialogue to truly be a dialogue, I think there must be an openness to any possible answer coming through. Um, literally any possibility, known or unknown, one must be open to that. And at least that's, at least we need to be as close to that as, as, we, as we possibly can, I think. And also I think, maybe we shouldn't think in terms purely of finding answers to questions because that that in itself could limit what what can come through so i think like we're doing today the questions are triggers uh they're just trigger points but they're not they're not limiting what we're allowing to come through um otherwise see in a sense a question already conditions the answer in in a sense it already the structure of the question already preempts a certain kind of answer in some way that a certain scope of answers a limited domain of possibility is already implicit in the question so we 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 want to use the question as a trigger to openness rather than as a closed boundary to possible things coming through. So uh, we need to be aware of how we're using the question answer process as well when we're doing this. Thank you. And a further additional question arises mm -hmm. in me. Might it be different to invite experts and non-experts to a question or to a trigger point or to a challenging topic experts and non-experts and listen and listen to to the information how you are saying it yeah. that is coming through that is unfolding through the participants who are experiencing this challenge. Again, I think we need to be a little bit careful when we're making distinctions here between experts and non-experts because that also could be limiting what is able to come through. Because if somebody is an expert, that would suggest that 
they already have a certain type of knowledge and information and probably a certain view or even a certain agenda that has given them that prestige of being called an expert. And that itself could also be limiting to what is able to come through because a lot of experts, so-called, ha have a very specific view about their field of expertise. Maybe, some, some, some time, some of the time. Um, and also, when we say that somebody is a, a non-expert, again, that can also act as a limitation to what the whole might want to be coming, coming through that person. So, maybe for a real radical dialogue to take place in, in the way we're talking about the, the, the true iteration of the circle, we need to soften that distinction between expert and non-expert. And, and, and we're all coming into the dialogue from an initial point of not knowing. Yes. Yeah. And then we allow the whole to speak through that not knowing rather than block off the whole through knowing. Because in a dialogue, what, what we want to come through is not conventional knowledge. What we want to come through is new creative insight. Um, and that insight, if you like, is looking for quiet minds through which to um, manifest itself through the, the, the mind that says, I don't know, rather than the mind that says, I know. And another additional question. So when we speak about, about creativity, mm. and maybe in me, um, spontaneously the artist arises and his creative work and artworks in different media. And as a question, and we are looking on, on the initial movement of any participant. So, But nevertheless, the, the question, is there a difference? Might there be a difference between um, a regular participant who expresses spontaneously uh, to the artist who is used and trained in his expertise, his or her expertise um, on a specific uh, medium? for example? Mm. Um, I think maybe, well, I mean, there's, there's two things that's coming up. I think speaking generally about dialogue and the contrast, possible contrast between a regular participant in dialogue and somebody who, who's coming for the first time, say, may simply be that the regular participant has developed a greater um, capacity for silence, a greater capacity for incarnating the whole through their own being and consciousness, simply through uh, the, the practice of dialogue, which is like a, a form of spiritual practice. 
Um, the second point is is there a difference between how the whole would manifest through somebody who's trained in a particular field like art and through somebody who's not trained in that particular field i would say that the whole as as the circle unfolds from the whole down through into the part it goes through this intermediary stage or realm that we call the subtle realm and somebody who's received a certain type of training and if that training is 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 deep and profound as it would be in somebody who's say a, a genuinely significant artist or musician or dancer through that training they have um i'm looking for the right words here they are they have um entrained certain patterns in their own morphogenetic field in a way that somebody who hasn't had that training has done. They may have a, 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 you know, a different set of patterns in their, in their field. Um, so each of us have our own set of subtle codes through which the whole is going to manifest. So the whole has to work with what is there. So when is manifesting, through person A, the whole has to, if you like, be filtered through the subtle codes of person A. And when the whole is manifesting through person B, the subtle codes of person B may be very different to the subtle codes of person A. So in that sense, the manifestation is going to be different. By the time you get down to the level of the creation, something new is going to, something different is going to come through each of these different people because the subtle filters, which have been trained through time or not trained at all, are going to be different between these two people. Um, however, the degree of openness to the whole that is potentially possible is the same between the two people. So, you know, my, my friend may have had great training in art. I may have had no training in art. So my friend's codes will be different to my codes. I won't have entrained my morphogenetic field with art training or capacity in the way that he has. So the whole will speak differently through my friend than it would speak through me. But both of us can still access that silence equally. So both of us, even though we're used in different ways, we can still be equally useful because we can still both have the same degree of opening despite the differences in our subtle makeup. So existentially, we're all, existentially, there's no hierarchy. Existentially, we, we, we all have equal capacity and potential to be used by the whole. But functionally, some of us may have different roles to play because of the way our fields have been um, entrained. So, different functions, but similar existential value and potential. Thank you, Nish. And um, the new order is popping up in me. So 
having these dialogue partners sharing their information, their subtle codes, and um, allowing through the process that creation takes place Is it hmm, through, yeah, the question, is it through these, through the two of them? The new order? Does dialogue need partners or may this process take place as an inner process that you come up with new information, new insights that you from your own inner dialogue create a new order or does a dialogue need these two person that creation happens? And um, what's what's the um, I want to come to the, uh, the the diamond model. The diamond model and um, its prerequisites. Hmm. Um, I don't think there has to be two people in order to move to a new order. I think one person by himself or herself can access the whole and allow the whole to speak through them uh, or allow new, more complex a new and more complex order of information to come through. And that's what artists do. Most artists maybe work by themselves when they're creating truly new art. Um, it's possible that with a, a dialogue partner or with several dialogue partners, there will be a greater possibility for a radically new order to emerge because the whole has several different parts through which to with which to engage and there are several different perspectives if you like that are into that there is an interplay of several different perspectives so maybe there is a an advantage to having more than one person simply to get that that greater possibility of perspectival permutations that you couldn't have just by yourself so easily um, and also maybe the possibility of a radically new order emerging increases exponentially the more number of people there are in the dialogue, simply because there, there, there's an exponentially greater potential for creative interplay than there would be with just one person. Thank you, Nish. May I? Uh, another question arises. 
Um, so when we speak about two people in a dialogue, um, assuming two manifested forms with structures, so really clear, <laughs> gruff entities, mm. and referring to these um, two entities between um, whom this creation unfolds. But while you were speaking um, and mentioning that an artist by himself is creating his, from his own inner process, mm. an artwork, but very often an artist is contemplating or is getting inspired from other artworks, mm -hmm. from, you know, from, from um, um, nature, from, so he or her um, has um, its resources, how to get inspired. So my question is, might a subtle, entity that is not as materialized as cross as people are for example uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. so but do we need do we need a sort of relation to get informed whether we are with ourselves when we go out to nature or sense or get inspired from uh, from a flower or a tree or or a discussion or another artwork. So I'm, I'm with myself, but the information I get is subtle. It's not cross. Mm -hmm. But I get inspired through a dialogue, through information that I receive. And there is a sort of uh, yeah, receiving, receiving that runs through my system, through my filters, through my codes, and enables me to create in whatever medium. Mm -hmm. So as a question, hmm. Hmm. It, is it a sort of openness and looking for building up a tension or intention said some new information may land or that I'm open for receiving new information. Yes, I think our dialogue partner can be, a, like you mentioned in one of your questions, can be a materially concrete person. And then we are two parts that are interacting at the gross level. Um, and if the dialogue is, is truly taking place, we are, there is that process of unfolding and unfolding through the subtle and back to the causal and so on. But there can also be, um, as you say, sources of inspiration that can effectively become immaterially imagined subtle objects that with whom we can also dialogue. It won't be necessarily through verbal speech, but there will be some relationship with the subtle element. And so a non-verbal dialogue will take place between the gross person and the subtle object, the subtle entity. And that might be even more powerful potentially than a dialogue between two people simply because the subtle in a sense is is nearer to the to the whole 
than the gross the gross is if, if we think in terms of distance the 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 enfolding process goes from the gross to the subtle back to the causal so if there's a dialogue between a gross artist and a subtle source of inspiration then one of the dialogue partners is already closer to the whole than would be the case if there were two merely two gross people who are based in the gross realm um, and i think this is probably quite common in 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 the field of art as you say even if there's no um, explicit dialogue going on artists often have sources of inspiration the root of which is in their minds and through their minds they're accessing that subtle archetype that the source of that inspiration represents so if you know, beethoven used to go for walks in the in the woods <laughs> when he wanted inspiration for his music. So he, he's, he's, he was having a dialogue, uh, an, an unspoken, non-verbal, implicit dialogue with uh, the, the subtle, the subtle archetypes to which the nature was pointing. I don't think that there's a literal dialogue with trees and leaves and plants but they, rep, they they are openings to something subtle and an, an artist like beethoven would be using nature or using somebody who he was in love with for example as a doorway to codes in the subtle realm mm -hmm. I love the expression doorway. Okay. No doorway in relation to nature getting inspired. And you spoke about nonverbal language mm -hmm. and a non explicit dialogue, but a sort of a doorway. So, a doorway through the senses. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what opens this? gate this doorway to enter to enter this inspirational field what is it and maybe we bridge we may bridge from here from this doorway to your model mm -hmm. to the new order the doorway so what enables us to open up to this doorway to become creative. I, I, I think uh, I would say the key to understanding that would lie in the distinction in the diamond model between the multiplicity and the fragmentation. So fragments can never be doorways or it's much more difficult for fragments to be doorways because they're not inherently related to the whole. They've moved away from the whole, uh, at least in our, in our perception of them. But multiplicity parts already exist in relation to the whole. That's why they're parts and not fragments. So if the artist can access multiplicity rather than fragmentation, then the multiplicity is a doorway to the whole because the multiplicity is already in relation to the whole and the whole and the part are opposite sides of the same coin so if beethoven is going for a walk in the woods and for for the objects in nature to act as doorways to the subtle and eventually to the whole ultimately he would need to be perceiving these objects in nature as parts and not fragments, which means he would have to be opening up to them with a quiet mind and a quiet heart, not 
constantly interpreting them through his noise that's already there. So I think this is also why artists often need to be in places of quiet, because quiet is a prerequisite for multiplicity, and the multiplicity is the multiplicity is the doorway to the whole. I would love to uh, to, uh, to to add mm. perception, mm. perception, as mm. you, you you mentioned it. You mentioned it several times. It is the subtlety, the quietness, and you mentioned perceiving mm. beyond the thinking. The quiet mind. So it's beautiful the, how it lands in me to, to, to perceive that. So um, the doorway is the quiet mind that allows the overall perception of all subtle qualities that arise in this very specific moment. And having the capacity to become aware. So in the way that the mind is in service in, an, in a different way. It's a question, it's a question, but um, would you agree to that? Yes, I think so, yes. Perception, true perception, is only possible when we are apprehending parts rather than fragments. Fragmentation takes us away from perception into... interpretation and I think we have to put the interpretative mind aside temporarily and move to a place of perception without interpretation temporarily in order to get in touch with the multiplicity that then is a doorway to the subtle codes so the thinking mind playing the role of interpreter can act as a block, can, can close the doorway mm -hmm. that way. Interpretation closes the doorway. So this is why nature is so perfect for an artist, because it's a very conducive medium for perception without interpretation. This is why we have nature mystics. They can perceive the various elements of nature without the thinking mind interfering. And when that goes deeply enough, then they see the whole in each part. Mm. You know, a poet can look at a leaf and he sees the whole of the universe in that leaf because his interpretive mind has been completely eliminated temporarily. So he can have a depth of perception, a depth of sensory perception that opens him up to that whole part union. And the subtle codes are, if you like, the intermediary between the whole and the part. So the subtle codes become available to the artist as soon as he has or she has started to access the whole through each part. Which, for which nature is eminently suited. And there are other, other human activities are suited to that as well. So a tree or a leaf gives access or can inspire access to the subtle codes, not because of what the tree and the leaf is in itself, but because when we perceive the tree and the leaf with sufficient depth, we start opening up to their 
true nature or truer nature or deeper nature, which is the whole. Everything is in each object. The whole of time is in each moment. That, that's the kind of perception that the artist needs to be moving towards in order to access that inspiration. And I think the inspiration sits between the whole and the part, if you like. And um, thank you. Um, two notes on that. Um, the interrelation between multiplicity and interconnectivity. Yeah. And again, my question on the diam diamond model um, in relation of creation, creativity. I think multiplicity is precisely that realm where the interconnection becomes apparent. When we lose sight of the interconnection, we've moved from multiplicity into fragmentation. Then we have fragments which are not connected to each other at all. That's why they're fragments. So if I take a, my television set and take a hammer and smash it to pieces, I'm going to have all these fragments that have no relation to each other. That's the kind of example you get. David Bohm gives these kind of examples. But if the television set is working together as it's supposed to work, then the different parts of that set are playing their role in connection with all the other parts. So when we're in the realm of multiplicity, we can see the unique role each part is playing, but we can also see how each part is an essential contributor and expression of the whole yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and that's the perception, I think, that has to be had to be able to access the doorway that leads to this deeper or greater inspiration. So I would say, yeah, multiplicity is the realm of interconnection. Fragmentation is the realm of um, dis disconnection between, between all of parts, and then they become fragments. As for the diamond model and creativity, what I would, the way I would see the diamond in that context. The diamond is like a fractal that is, takes different forms in different contexts. So in the context of the creative process, um, I would say that wholeness at the, the, the top of the diamond, I would refer to that as the silence from which all creativity comes ultimately. Then we have the separation of the whole into the subject object. That would be the subtle realm which would contain the codes of that we would need to access as creators. Uh, and the inspiration, the codes that enfold the inspiration. And then as the subject and object interplay to create multiplicity, the multiplicity would be the, would be the creation. So the whole manifests as the subtle codes. The subtle codes work together to create, to, to produce, to um, allow the emergence of creation in the realm of multiplicity. And if we lose contact or sight of that silence, then the creation becomes repetition. So the fragmentation in this context is repetition. When there's simple repetition, there's no genuine creation. And the ground of all being would be the ultimate non-duality between the silence and the creation. So, 
you'd have the, the non-duality between the silence and the creation manifest as the silence, manifest as the subtle codes, manifest as creation. And then if creation moves away from the silence, we get repetition. That would be... Mm -hmm. We need all with this alignment mm. with the whole, being yes. in connection, feeling this, feeling this interconnectivity. Yes. Mm. Because the subtle realm is more than just thought. Thought and feeling come together in the subtle realm. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm. I'm now with um, multiplicity and um, the appearance of creation in different forms, in different orders, in new orders, different new orders. So also in different um, structures, um, in different codes also, in different languages. So um, pointing to the new order, is there a universal law on the creation of this new, let's say, entity? In whatever form it appears, but is there, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. A principle. Mm, mm. I, I think that there are certain fields that take different shapes in every different order and manifestation. And those fields are the universal principles that are there in every paradigm or new order of being and consciousness. So could you please repeat it again? Yes, yes. yes. This is I know this is this is a more difficult notion to, to 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 grasp. I think if we think of Think of the spiral dynamics model, just to give one example. As we see new paradigms emerging, each color is like a new paradigm. Mm. And we see new paradigms emerging, beige, purple, red, blue, orange, green, and so on. I would suggest that there are certain universal principles, which I'm referring to as fields, that are present in every single level, but they take different forms in each level. So the field morphs into different shapes mm -hmm. as new orders of cognition arise mm -hmm. in the whole. So I'll give you, I mean, I'll give you some examples. I mean, um, Spirit and self are two very basic fields that take different forms and different shapes as these new levels emerge. So every level of development is going to have some concept or some experience of what they would refer to as spirit the ultimate reality, what, what is ultimately real, and the self, who am I really? And their conception or experience of this will change 
orange will have a very different view of that to red, which will have a very different view of that to green. But all of them will have some kind of conception or experience of spirit and self. So spirit and self are constants all the way up, but they take lots of different shapes as they morph, the field morphs into different shapes as, it, as these levels evolve. Um, and I think there are many fields like that. Um, when I'm considering, say, the, the development of spirituality or religion, I've suggested that there are seven fields that morph. So, I mean, I've called these spirit, self, suffering, hope, knowledge, salvation, love. And you can find these seven fields in any spiritual tradition. But these seven fields morph into different shapes as different levels emerge as human consciousness develops. So in a similar way, as we move into different orders through dialogue, and, and the transformation there may not be as enormous as you get in, in, in a spiral dynamics model, but the different orders that emerge through uh, dialogue, the creativity that emerges in dialogue, when you move into different orders of perception, uh, I would suggest there are still these constant fields that are always there. But as each new order emerges through dialogue, the fields morph into different shapes. That, that, that's the, the existence of these fields is what ensures the continuity between these different orders that are emerging. Otherwise, you just have these discontinuous chaos Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a moment, just a yeah, moment. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you. So um, we are looking on the development of uh, spirit and self through yeah. the evolution of mankind, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we notice uh, that as we are reflecting on our observation, on our experience, and um, and we are assuming that now, so the next new order will evolve from the recent state. Mm. Mm. And um, is there a relation or must there be a, um, a certain interrelation between all the states that we, we evolved is there an interconnectivity with, between all these qualities that appeared, that created shapes? Mm. Must all these forms be present in us in a way? So in a way conscious. Um, and um, when we evolve from one to the next, to the next is the, new order always does it appear in in the way of the diamond model i think that yes i think that there, there are my, this is my perception and experience of 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 this is that there are some basic minimal fields that are present always and that is what gives structure and coherence to each new degree of order that emerges. Um, and as the degrees of order become more and more complex, these universals change into more and more complex shapes. But if we look vertically, if you like, through the levels, we will see these universals always present. I think speaking in spiral dynamics terms, this insight is what arises really strongly at turquoise. At turquoise, one can turn around and 
see the levels through which, if you like, look back down across the levels through which one has already evolved in one's life. And one can clearly see these shapes, the, these fields morphing into these different shapes. And the, the way that the, the interrelationship between the shapes, between the levels, so we can see this, this dance of principle all the way through history, our own personal history. Um, and the, but, but the, this, this dance of these shapes is unified by these fields that exist in some way outside of development. Yes. Um, what appears in me, thank you, beautiful. This dance looking onto what has evolved, but in me appears the witness. Mm -hmm. so, um, is it a capacity to, to be able to witness and to interrelate and to interconnect, to see, as you said, to see down vertically downwards what, what already is present and always present and continuously appearing and disappearing and again, and, but growing also. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, the capacity of, uh, of being able to witness this, these processes mm -hmm. is the witness a prerequisite as well, maybe for, let's say, this state of two across. I think the capacity for witnessing strengthens as we develop, because the di the dynamic between each. Uh, level and the next level is that what was subject at one level becomes object at the next level. So at blue, what was the subject at blue becomes the object in orange and so on. So that's how we evolve from first person to second person to third person to fourth person to fifth person. So in a, in a sense, we are strengthening our subjective capacity as we develop. And as that strengthens, the subject in its purity is the witness consciousness. So as we develop, that witness consciousness emerges and becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And yes, I, 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 I would speculate, based on my experience, is that when it's at turquoise that the witness consciousness capacity becomes strong enough Mm -hmm. to be able to perceive these cross paradigmatic universals mm -hmm. that are always present no matter how the development proceeds. And what one is starting to move into now is the subtle because these fields in themselves, prior to the specific shapes they take across development, are subtle archetypes. So as one moves into turquoise, one is almost at the threshold of being able to perceive these subtle archetypes. Well, we're not perceiving them directly at that point, but we're perceiving the way in which they are operating throughout development. And I think the diamond, the diamond model, I think the whole, the part, the diamond is effectively four basic principles, the whole and the part, the subject and the object. When the whole and the part are one, you have the ground. When the whole and the part are, there's a disjunction between the two, you have fragmentation. And you have an in, in involution from the whole down to the part, and you have an evolution from the part back to the whole. My suggestion is that this entire diamond structure is a field that morphs into different shapes as we ascend the spiral. So 
blue is going to the, the blue diamond is going to be very different to the green diamond, which is very different to the turquoise diamond, but it's still the diamond. Mm. So blue will perceive the whole and the part and the subject and the object differently to how yellow would perceive those. Mm. So the diamond is, is an example of this universal field that I'm suggesting is always present at every level. Mm. And my speculation is the diamond is a very, very fundamental field. And that's why we're able to find applications for it almost anywhere. You can take almost any field of human endeavor in the arts, the sciences, the relationships, anything, and you'll find diamonds everywhere because this is a universal field that is always present. Mm -hmm. And these universal fields are necessary to structure and give order and coherence to whichever level or context one is putting one's attention on at any given time. Um, Thank you so much. This is a new for information for me in ap apprehending. So the, the diamond model on every level um, is present, mm -hmm. but is different mm -hmm. in itself. The structure yeah. is different, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, it's a diamond. Mm -hmm. um, or we could say the structure is the same, but the content is different. That's another way of putting it. The structure, yes, yeah, seen as a model. Mm -hmm. and the structure is, yeah, okay, yeah. And that's why I sometimes refer to it as a fractal as well, because it's uh, you see that same pattern appearing everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's a universal fractal, which may be another way of talking about at the universal principle or field. The, the, the function, if, if the causal is manifesting as the gross, the function of the subtle is to give structure and coherence to the gross. The subtle is the structure giving realm. That's why we find archetypes in the subtle. They, the archetypes structure the gross manifestation. So these universal fields that morph into different shapes at different levels are actually that they have their source in the structure and coherence giving archetypes that you find at the subtle. So, so, so when we're looking at something like the diamond or these seven principles I mentioned earlier about religion, we're, we're getting a peek into the subtle realm through our conceptual mind still, but we're getting a peek into what these archetypes might actually be in the subtle realm. A sneak preview. Thank you. And you give, you give another impulse to me with the term peak. So, um, P, P double E K, <laughs> yes, not not P E A K, P double E K, <laughs> yes, but I want to refer to peak, mm -hmm. <laughs> P E A K, okay, um, is the moment of creation. And um, so uh, feeling, feeling this creative moment, this peak moment, mm. we, um, we listened to a talk in Broughton mm. um, when, when the person shared that from this creative moment, from this peak point, 
it is very clear to, um, to go to this moment back in time when this process started. So my question is, so we've been, now we've been in the field of the future, looking mm. onto this peak moment, P-A-K, that referred back to the initial moment when this creative process started. Mm. I don't know if this gives a question, but it is, we were very astonished during this talk that it is possible that there's to see the interrelation, the interrelation of, you know very precisely where it starts and where it ends. Mm. Or, but David Bohm, would say so everything is in flux and it is only a relative entity and it is never it never ends but at this very moment it it mm, was at a point like feeling I don't know coherent or complete or I would say these peak moments might be representing themselves doorways to the subtle realm. And maybe the way that the, the capacity to look back and say this is where the peak started and ended, maybe because when we're moving into the turquoise dimension, I think we start to go beyond linear time at that point. That's it. Yeah. yeah. The, and because time itself is a field that morphs into different shapes, time is one of these universal fields that take different shapes as we move up the levels. And linear time is just one particular shape that the time field can take. And we can speculate it's sort of somewhere between red and yellow that we have linear time. But once we start to reach the peak of yellow into turquoise, I think we start to move quite definitively into nonlinear time or translinear time, which is why it's at that precise moment we're able to turn round for the first time and see the evolution of our own field structures. That the capacity to turn around and see these fields doesn't. I think isn't possible, I think, prior to that moment, because we're still, the shape of the time field is still linear at that point. Um, yeah. So space, space and time, which are interrelated, are fields that morph into different shapes as we ascend, which is why we see the development of science and the development of physics through different levels, because they're getting in touch with these different shapes as space and time morph. But we need our sense of time to be sufficiently subtle for it to go beyond that, the confines of linearity. And I think that emerges at, I, I would speculate high yellow, early turquoise is where that starts to emerge. So these fields become very obvious, I think, to the turquoise mind. And the turquoise mind, through its own body-mind integration, can even feel the development of those fields within one's own organism as one has evolved. As, as feeling structures within one's body-mind. So it's not just intellectual anymore. It actually, you can feel these fields. And that's when that, that feeling becomes the doorway then to the subtle codes. In fact, I would suggest that these fields are themselves. They have their source in these subtle codes. And that's what we're 
getting a glimpse of mm -hmm. when we're talking about about this. Thank you for getting a taste of this further dimension. Mm. Mm. I think uh, we are coming to nearly to the end of our mm. talk. Mm. And uh, let me have a look to, uh, to the questions. Mm. Do you have um, still some questions? holding what we could maybe discuss in more detail next time is what you brought up in one of your questions is what are the degrees and intensities of creativity and their amplifiers mm -hmm. so maybe we could go into that next time because i think we have different forms of creativity gross subtle causal non-dual mm -hmm. so we could talk about that and also you asked, what is the creative dialogue process of manifesting? There again, we could talk about how that entire unfolding, enfolding process of dialogue has to engage with all of these levels, gross, subtle and causal. We could go into that in more detail. And you also asked, what is the difference between the creative process in dialogue and art? Mm -hmm. So there I, we could talk about some of the contrasts between the, the kind of definiteness that is involved in producing a, a, a definitive product and something like this, which is far more open-ended with no definitive product at the end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, th those are things we could go into in more detail, um, maybe in our next in our next dialogue, if that sounds, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. Mm. Um, yeah, thank you for creating um, our content for the next time. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, wonderful. I do have to digest a lot. Yeah, there's a lot coming through here, yeah, <laughs> which I wasn't expecting to be talking about fields and, and shapes, but it's good. It's good if, if unexpected things come through that's a good sign i think yes thank you yeah. for allowing me to to ask yeah. additional questions that arise really no soon. that's that's great i welcome i welcome anything that that comes down comes out comes up well how do you feel I, I feel quite energized, actually. I, I feel we've gone through some, we've touched upon some quite significant um, notions, which we, we could go into in more depth next time. But uh, yeah, I feel quite energized. I think we're, it feel, there's a, it, there's a, a feeling of rightness about where we're going with this, I think. What about you? How do you feel? Yes, there's joy alive in me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, a kind of playfulness. Mm -hmm. Gratitude that you allow me simply to voice what's, what's arising and what's appearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I stopped the recording. Okay. <laughs>